For assignment seven, you guys are going to be doing the most kind of direct and easy to understand type of digital art. If you remember to the very beginning of the class, we talked about the four main approaches to digital art. Digital painting was one of them. And it's because all you're doing is using the computer as a tool to make your own pixels. And you can make those pixels do whatever you want. All right. So just to get introduced to this, it takes quite a while to master it in any way, but just to, to have everyone get some experience with it so that they can decide whether they want to use it as part of their final project or not. I'm limiting you to two different types of subject matter. You can do a portrait in any kind of style, as long as it's digital painting, not digital coloring. And for that portrait, I want you to do basically from the shoulders up. I don't want you to try to do a full body because that gets into anatomy and, and other issues that are going to occupy your, your time and your your frustration that don't have to do with digital painting. Or you can do an animal, but if you do an animal, I'd like you to do the entire animal. And we're going to do both of them just on blank white backgrounds. You can always fill in a background later. And again, any kind of stylization you like. This is an example of how you can fill in a background later. And you can take inspiration. Not only do you need some sort of photo reference to post, but you might need some stylistic inspiration. So this is a student who did a self-portrait using the colors of his favorite piece of clothing. right? And you can really push and pull this. I wanted to turn this photo reference into a Happy Holidays card and kind of tweaked and exaggerated the proportions and pose of this rhinoceros and then like built Happy Holidays into his folds. There's all kinds of things you can do with digital painting. There are multiple ways we can start digital painting. And multiple ways it can be explored. So just like for digital coloring, we had an exhaustive explanation of digital coloring. For, for color separation, we have an exhaustive explanation of color separation. This, these are my slides for digital painting. Just like digital coloring had a lot of aspects of Wonder Woman with the golden lasso and color holds and flat color and duotone color. This is a digital painting of Wonder Woman. And you'll see the difference is they still sketch it out, but very quickly they build shapes of color on top of the sketch. It doesn't matter if the sketch is clean or soft, it gets replaced by lots and lots of, of pixels layered on top. This is kind of my handout for digital coloring. No matter what the end product you want, these are both photorealistic digital paintings of fruit, right? You can start it either with line drawing, kind of like in traditional painting, you might use pencil or charcoal to kind of sketch it out and then fill it in with flat color or base color, you would call in painting, and then just refine it up. Remember, in digital, you can erase, you can take out, you can clean up edges. Uh, depending on your paint material, that might be more challenging traditionally than it is in digital. So this is a traditional model based on a sketched line. This is a model based on shape painting or an underpainting without using charcoal or pencil or anything first. You just start with paint and then you refine those paint shapes as you go. And also painting does not mean it has to be photorealistic. So a lot of people make the mistake that if you're doing a digital painting, it needs to match the photograph. Instead, the photograph is just your reference, and you can decide to make it match as closely as you want. This is my doing a portrait of the author, oh, James Joyce, and using a photo from him and matching that photo so completely that I even got how his collar was messed up in the photo, right? Because if you match a photo, you're going to also capture everything that's not good in the photo <laughs> into your painting. But this is also using my own color palette and being a little bit creative with it. But what I'll often do is build this with different layers as a digital painting and then strip back certain layers and play with certain aspects and find an abstraction I like of it. And then I might even strip it back to the point where it's not recognizable as a portrait anymore. And then I might combine certain things together, right, to end up with the final painting, the final composition. So you can have your own stylistic version, but we always base it on a photo because that's what helps us learn. So when you're working from reference and building something, 
no matter how imaginative or creative or experimental you'll get with your process, you want to pay attention to detail. We're going to learn how to make our own brushes because the edges of your strokes are going to have a lot to do with how your digital painting feels. We're going to block your colors first. It's a lot like flat coloring, but base coloring is basically just getting rid of all the white and replacing it with an intentional color first. And then we're going to modify and refine on top of that. And we're going to use the brush tool and basically nothing else in Photoshop. And the only other tool that we're going to toggle between is the option key to give us the eyedropper tool to steal colors from other things open in Photoshop, mostly from our references. And you can use layers as little or as much as you want, but there are some, are some advantages to traditional painting. So this is a, a past student example that captured his process along the way. He's working from the photo reference of Jack Black. You can see that the more photo reference you have, the better. But And then at steps along the way, he will actually transform the whole piece, rotate it, stretch it, warp it. That's probably the biggest advantage of digital painting over traditional painting is you can correct yourself if you see that you've made, you like pushing into a, a wrong area. That doesn't mean that you're going to be perfectly correct by the end, but it means you have like kind of maximum flexibility while you're working. And you work from basic shapes to more specific. This is that same student doing a self-portrait. Remember, you can play with color, you can play with proportions, you can play with ideas of caricature. It all becomes a part of personal expression. And my favorite aspect of digital painting is no matter what you make digitally, even if it's vector design that you rasterize, right? Even if it's photo composites, like our creatures or our landscapes. Here we have two different artists that use photo compositing for different purposes. One's for concept art and creature design for video games. One's for fine art and landscape. Um, but they both use digital painting over the top of that to finish off the work because it gives you ultimate control. Right? You want to replace the pixels, you can just paint on top of them. So I have lots of examples of dragons in this presentation. That's because my, my kids are into D&D &D and they love to see dragon art. But what's so amazing is all of these are finished digital paintings that all have kind of a different style at the end. And they all start in a different way with different levels of detail, different levels of uh, line art. Sometimes the line art like this is incredibly clean. And then they even color behind the line art with flat color, duotone color, until at this step it becomes digital painting. So once you color over your lines, whether they're clean lines or not, it, it's no longer digital coloring, it's digital painting. That's different than a color hold. This artist uses completely clean line art, but then covers everything with brush strokes and gets what looks like kind of a textured watercolor by the end. But they, that line art's very, very clean. All right. So you can learn a lot from how different artists work. Uh, a lot of you in your presentations were using digital, the, the artist you were presenting on were using digital painting of some type. And it's not just making kind of photorealistic airbrushes like this, right? And if you're limited to one photo reference like this is, then your lighting is going to be limited to that one lighting source. Then your shadows and things lost to shadows, like her ears, are only ever going to be lost to shadow in your painting. So it's good to have multiple references if possible, whether you start by sketching or whether you start with just what's called speed painting. And you can even push it in different directions. You can go more designy with it. This is still digital painting. Notice it's not behind line art. And you might even do some thumbnails of different approaches. So you can do an animal. You can do a person. I'm going to demonstrate with an animal. And this is what I was thinking for this semester for us. My partner's mother just got a kitten. or got a kitten about nine months ago. And that kitten has grown up a lot. And it's named Freya. And I'm quite fond of, I'm not a big cat person usually, but I'm pretty fond of this cat. And I thought it would be interesting 
to do a painting of this Siamese cat. So I have a few different photos. And then there are some stylistic references of some interesting contemporary painting that is hand done, not uh, digitally done, but it doesn't really matter. And then I liked this charcoal drawing as well. And so this is one that's full body, you know, it will be a nice kind of portrait of it. So this will be my primary reference. And then I'm going to use artificial intelligence here that's linked in question of the day four. To get kind of a, a pellet, pellet knife painted oil example of a Siamese cat. Even though I have a typo there, it should be fine. And that might inform me too, just as some stylistic reference. So I'm going to go to Photo P, our good old raster program. That's what digital paintings are done in. And I'm going to create two files. The first one I'm going to create is just a composite of my references whether they are AI generated or found online or photos taken by me. New project. Uh oh, I might need to wait for this is done before the browser can handle more. I'll close some of this other stuff. Remember these browser based are all sharing the, the operational memory of the browser. All right. So here we go. So this is what it gave me. Not amazing. Doesn't look like a pellet knife too much. Maybe I put in, so you can see how this can take some time, like full body digital painting, Siamese cat. I'm going to try in the style of something very different, like uh, Franz Mark. He's a German expressionist. Very colorful. That's going to help build on these. And then I also got some uh, other AIs. These were having the, uh, the Crayon app generate Japanese woodblock prints from like the Yukioi period, which is like 1850. And I just like some of these gradations and some of these values that I thought might look nice on a Siamese cat. So we can mix and match lots of different things. This one is pretty close to what I was thinking with Franz Mark. So I might download that. And put that into my mix. Because that's original inspiration. Okay, so now within PhotoP, I'm going to set up a new project that is 8 by 10 inches, just like we're used to doing. At 350, I'll just do 300, at 300 pixels per inch, print size. And then I'm going to drag in my primary reference. And you can use your compositing stills to clean it up. Might make this a little bit smaller to be able to fit in some of the others. And then maybe my secondary reference for like style notes. And then I want a little bit crazier options. And because even if you're doing a portrait of a of an animal, it's good to see them from different angles, especially the head from different angles to get a sense of what they're like. I don't know if I need that one, though it's another full body one if I didn't want to